Welcome to Birken Forest Monastery's live stream. I'm Ajahn Sona. Let us proceed with the first question, Pia. Ajahn, our first question today is from Raphael in France. Greetings, Ajahn. Does the Buddha have anything to say about pornography? My apologies for the crude nature of this question, and many thanks for your teaching. Well, the question is not crude at all. Uh, <clears throat> I think, we, you know, this is part of life. Uh, the Buddha himself talks, uh, at least the what we find in the descriptions of his early life in the in the palace is that he is apparently from a well-off family, sort of aristocratic family. Um, this caste, by the way, is is called the Kshatriyas. Uh, and it's kind of the, the warrior caste, the kingly caste. <clears throat> and they're not... Uh, we have to know the context of the 5th century BC in, in India and how they organize things, you know. Uh, this is not a time of uh, the, the, uh, what we now, the idea we have in the West of Christian marriage where one man, one woman for, for life, this kind of thing. Although, uh, of course, it's usually completely hypocritical. It's very few people that are few few couples that managed to carry it out. Anyway, at that time, there was no such ideas. Um, there were a lot of uh, <clears throat> dancing girls in the palace and so forth. So he would have been bombarded with an, uh, the opportunity for sensual pleasures of all kinds. He found it shallow, uh, the, the life of a kind of a of an intelligent playboy. <laughs> you see this kind of lifestyle. Wealthy young men with just handed everything and uh, they indulge. But if they're of a higher quality of mind, then they, they wonder if this is it. Is this all there is? So he went on, a, on the opposite quest and indulged in some extreme austerities and eventually came out the other side in a middle path. But was uh, this middle path uh, from a modern Western view is quite austere. Uh, <clears throat> he renounced all uh, sexual activity whatsoever, including any kind of mental uh, sensual activity, thoughts as well. Uh, he's able to do that. It's not that he's suppressing this. He is uh, simply not, no longer interested. So he has outgrown the sensual desires. Uh, and along with it, he's outgrown his uh, uh, aversive thinking as well. He's no longer irritated by the world, humanity, <coughs> A nature, animals, whatever it is not, do not provoke any kind of aversion in him. And they don't provoke any kind of desire in him either. He doesn't want any of it. <clears throat> so his attitude is, is very clear in terms of, of sensuality. If you want to be free of both greed and hatred, uh, you, you aspire to that at the at the level of thought and action. And it requires reflection. It requires training of the mind. It requires an idea that there's an alternative to being angry and uh, caught in the polarity of anger and desire for things in the world, including sex. So this is... You know, if if you really want to be free, you have to transcend all, all of this, these this po this polarity of desire and uh, and anger. Uh, so it's very clear, and uh, all of the teachings laid down in the rules of conduct for the monks are inclined that way. <clears throat> he does it very skillfully, though. Um, by the way, he doesn't. Uh, necessarily advocate that for the family life, the lay life. 
His comments on uh, sex in uh, in the layperson's life or in in, in the, anybody outside of Buddhism, there are of course many people following different re- religions and so forth. His comment about it is it's it's just it's vil- it's the village practice. It's the it's the translation is low, coarse, vulgar. <laughs> Uh, it's what people do. It's not very exalted. Sometimes th- this message is... Uh, ha- in the West, we went through all these revolutions where there was a, a feeling that, that a strong suppression of sexuality and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Christianity, <clears throat> especially in the 18th, 19th centuries, and then there was this reaction, a revolution against it, and saying, "Oh, it's the cause of so much neurosis and you know Freudian suffering and so forth because of suppression of of sexual desire and all this." This is uh, if you go outside of the entire Western culture and you look at an independent culture uh, of Buddhism, they 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 were way ahead of this. They they're, they recognize that it's not not a liberation to just indulge in, in sexual desire and stimulation of, of that. It's not not at all liberation. It's just uh, surrendering to your mm-hmm. instincts, which are are natural, but not terribly shameful or anything. But uh, simply just trap you <clears throat> in a lower realm. Uh, so uh, the Buddha does not regard it as wicked or anything. It's just natural. And it's just like, yeah, if you want to stay uh, in uh, the trivial and the lower uh, experiences, then you, 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 you just follow your desires. <laughs> and you will find that there, it's not satisfactory. So pornography is, a, of course, more or less a modern, more modern phenomena. You... You do see <clears throat> uh, incredibly graphic three-dimensional carvings on temples in India. Uh, every, all of the most graphic kind of sexual acts are <laughs> carved in stone on these temples, and the, but these are uh, prom, primarily these are t- tantric temples, which is completely divorced from the from the Buddhist idea. Of, uh, you cannot find a trace of that, uh, those notions in the early Buddhist texts. People are co- quite confused about this. They, they, they talk about tantric Buddhism and all this, but there, 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 there is uh, no indication whatsoever of this in the early Buddhist texts. These are later uh, uh, cultic uh, developments. Uh, at the, uh, of course, uh, when we talk about pornography in the modern times, we're talking about it as uh, video and ph- photography and everything. Of course, they didn't have such things at the time of the Buddha. Uh, so he has nothing particular to say about images. Uh, we also have to say that uh, at the time, in the culture, the, the competing religion, the Jains, went naked. Uh, the, the holy, The holy people that were competitors to the Buddhist wear a, a stark naked wear a, a stark naked woman philosopher, uh, Jain philosopher, is debating in the park with like Sariputta, one of the chief disciples of the Buddha. <laughs> it's quite a quite an image. Uh, there's all kinds of cultures and times in, in history when uh, women, for instance, went uh, entirely topless. That was not; it was considered normal. So, uh, there's there's a lot of things to consider. We we have ideas about these things in modern times, <coughs> relating it to modern times. In the rules for monks, there's uh, all kinds of careful rules for. Uh, about sex and so forth. They don't talk about images at all because they're basically 
mm-hmm. aren't any. And of course, you can't blame if 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 the monk is debating a naked woman in in the public park. <laughs> you can't blame the monk for the woman being naked. <laughs> So the, it's a it's an area of uh, that is a, a modern phenomena. It's very recent again in the West that uh, that pornography is even legal. Uh, it was very much illegal just in my lifetime. It was you get thrown in jail for having a, a even a porno, pornographic uh, book like just text. Uh, let alone pictures. So th- this is a very recent occurrence, the making it legal, uh, pornography legal. And so uh, this is a grand experiment being performed on a massive population. Uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, there's all kinds of indications that it's very problematic for for especially the younger People, but not just younger people, uh, people of all ages, etc., that get swallowed up by it. Same with drug addiction. Uh, it's a it's a sensuous, uh, sensual uh, thing, and it becomes uh, addictive. And so, it's a grand uh, experiment, and we do not know how it ultimately will go. <laughs> Once the genie is out of the bottle as well, it's very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle. <clears throat> how, do you, how do you change this? Uh, so there, there are a lot of attitudes. The Buddhist, Buddhism, though, doesn't have a kind of moralistic or attitude towards sex that it's a sinful thing. Um, there, are, there, are, there is very definitely the third precept is that uh, one should not be exploitive or... or uh, Sexual misconduct is really conduct that it that exploits another person or steps over the boundaries, violence or inappropriate conduct. It has nothing to do actually with any particular type of sexual activity, uh, nor anything to do with pornography either. It's it's uh, harm uh, acts which are harmful to another person. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, homosexuality or any of these things. Uh, even uh, polygamy or any of this stuff, because polygamy was very common at the time of the Buddha, uh, and it's not not considered a, a, a problem. It's uh, just one form of marriage. So, the the core issue is. Uh, do you want to be preoccupied with sen- sensuous desire or not? And if if you wish not to be, then you need to elevate yourself above it and you will feel very, very well. You will feel freed from these, what is called debt. So sensuous desire is a form of debt and you need... In order to be ha- happy, you need the next hit, but the, the happiness doesn't last very long, and then you need another hit. So you're in debt to the your sens- sens- sensory reward. It could be drugs, could be sex, uh, could be rock and roll. <laughs> this is, by the way, this uh, saying, uh, what is it? Drugs, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, sex, and, rock drugs and, rock. and rock and roll. We got to get the right order here. Sex, drugs, rock and roll mm-hmm. is an updated version of the more, the older, more Shakespearean thing of wine, women, and song. But it seems to be in that order, it seems to be the drugs come first, the, the wine, then the then the sex, and then the song, yes. So I think it was revised by Mick Jagger. <laughs> he updated the saying. <laughs> Uh, being a literary man himself, he updated the saying. <clears throat> so this is, yeah, you can see this tangle uh, of drugs, sex, and music can be, you know, sensory music. Uh, this is, uh, much of humanity is enmeshed in this. Uh, you can see all kinds of cultures which are 
recognize the problem and have strict attempts to m moderate or uh, legal, make, uh, make s such activities illegal. And then other cultures that just give up <laughs> and say, well, whatever. You, you, we can't be spending all our resources on, on getting you away from these vices. So they're called vices. Uh, this is all, okay, so we have to tie this in with drug, drugs, the drug problem uh, at present as well. Uh, it's just a catastrophe in the West at the moment. Uh, the use of drugs is just, people are uh, dying on the streets. It's kind of, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Mm -hmm. What to do about this? Um, should we just legalize it all? Uh, or should we have severe <clears throat> suppression of it? Uh, which, how, to, how to deal with the, the whole issue? So this is, this is uh, welcome to an age-old situation for humanity. But ultimately, the Buddha says, it comes down to the individual. You must choose your freedom. And you must, only through your wisdom and dedicated practice, can you transcend this um, loser, the loser game of sensuality and aversion. So the, we have our, the, the drugs and the sex, and then even worse, the wars and the violence. And uh, so can you rise above this? The, but the Buddha is also renouncing violence uh, under all conditions as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a tangle a terrible tangle that humanity is is caught in and, and the only only the, you know, only the individual the self-motivated individual can transcend this so that's the general advice which you can apply to all kinds of things not just pornography but uh, all kinds of elements in society which are under question all the time if you if you have this primary vision of life that you must elevate yourself above these things in order to be free and you're not free until you do, then that's the Buddhist answer to it. And then you can apply that general attitude to all of these things. Yeah. Next question from the live chat is from Vlad. Hello, Venerable Sona. My friend who studies Tibetan Buddhist texts from time to time tells me that the Buddha gave the discourses on Prajna Paramita in the second year of his teaching career. How come? Well, that is a uh, mythological, uh, that's, that's a whole other school. Uh, mm -hmm. That is Mahayana uh, ideas and the, the, the idea of the Prajna Paramita suttas and so forth there. A tri sutras, by the way, uh, all, most of these sutras are, are, are in Sanskrit and they're, they're translated into Sanskrit and they move throughout Asia in Sanskrit, and then they're sometimes mixed, hybrid mixes in, uh, with other languages, uh, Chinese and uh, uh, Tibetan, Korean, J Japanese, and so forth. You find that the originals are in Sanskrit as ver uh, versus the Pali of the Theravada. So the Theravada is, uh, is a, one of the early schools, uh, there, are, there is a school before any sectarian uh, division. It's simply the, the Buddha Dhamma uh, at the time of the, say, at the time of the Buddha. Within, within a century of the time of the Buddha, there began to be differences in certain interpretations mm -hmm. of, the, of the teachings. And uh, then they develop into these various sectarian uh, structures. The Theravada holds that the Pali Canon is the word of the Buddha as, as, as best we could have captured it in, in terms of history. The, many of the sutras from the uh, 
uh, in the Sanskrit, in the Mahayana, are much later, uh, just from a, a linear historical perspective. Uh, these occur and are created uh, centuries later by monks. And they attribute the sutra to the Buddha. And quite often he's situated on the vulture's peak or something like this, and he says this and he says that. And it's quite in conflict with uh, some of the, the basis, uh, the early teachings. But once you decide that through various spiritual or religious ideas that mm -hmm. these are actually the word of the Buddha and somehow they were not available for the first 700 years, but then they came into existence. And so these are, in the West, we would call these apocryphal um, attributions to the Buddha. And uh, whole schools of Buddhism uh, are committed to this or believe that. I, I am not of that. I, I, I actually began uh, in my studies, Buddhist studies, with the Mahayana school, and, and, and including the Tibetan school, and were introduced to these sutras and so forth. It was, it was a, 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 Buddhism is a massive edifice of teachings, and it was quite some time before I, I really scrutinized the different messages that are all represented as Buddhism. And then I had to really explore it. Well, what is, uh, well, where do these things come from? Who says that this is the word of the Buddha and who says that? So I really had to do a deep dive into the history of the Buddhist schools. And uh, my conclusion is, as you can see, that I'm a Theravada monk. <laughs> I am a advocate of the Pali Canon as the best, the best capturing of the uh, historical Buddhist teachings. And I do not, uh, I'm not under the impression that, that there were either teachings that the Buddha gave to special disciples that he didn't give to the, in the that are not given in the Pali Canon or any of that. I, I, I'm pretty dismissive of that. Of that. So um, <clears throat> the, that is what the perplexity. So in the West now we're, We've made huge strides in terms of the population, not the population in general, but at least people who are interested in Buddhism being more educated about these things, starting to understand the history of this. Even in Asia, of course, because people live in different countries and there wasn't great communication in the different schools, they're, they're hardly aware of the, of the contradictions and the conflicts between these schools. And... So this is a time when a lot of uh, sorting out is taking place. Modern scholarship, historical evidence, archaeology, even DNA studies are telling us it, this is a golden age of the recovery of Dhamma and a, a incredible amount of information available to, to anybody at any time including this channel, Ajahn Sona's YouTube channel is, there's 310 videos now. And we're covering in detail many of these things, uh, historical aspects, see, see the, fil the video on uh, Greek monks in early Buddhist schools. The, 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 we're, we're recovering all kinds of things that, that were formerly obscure. Because of this uh, thing called the internet, Formerly, you would have to have a sabbatical as a university professor, sabbatical at the British Museum for a year to find some obscure books in the back dusty shelves. Now, you just push a button uh, anytime, day or night, for free, and somebody will give you whole lectures on, on the history of Buddhism and the differences in the schools. It's, it's quite astonishing the amount of information, and it has never been available to people before. So this, you know, you, it is remarkable. So uh, keep watching for more and more and in-depth information, yeah. Next question comes from the live chat from Prop Chalakon. 
Hello, Ajahn. Any advice for dealing with homesickness when traveling to a new place? Well, again, with this medium of communication, it's just fun. what you couldn't do before. You know, I'm, I'm born in a time when you, I had to go, I, I went off to school on the other side of the country. And uh, I had to write a le letters, you know, and it, the, the round trip thing for a letter was, you know, several weeks. You know? <laughs> uh, or you, had, you made a phone call to your parents or something on a pay phone. Uh, it was just uh, mm -hmm. very hard to communicate. But now it's free, uh, FaceTime, and, you know, I'm not even going to... Uh, I'm not going to promote any brands, or, <laughs> but uh, even as a monk, I, 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 the the ability to communicate uh, with anybody anywhere in the world is staggering now, and it's just you can have access to this anytime, and uh, also just things like this channel. If you're Buddhist, you can. It's just like going to a temple and having a, a talk, you know listening to a talk, and mm -hmm. you see the uh, question bar on the side, and you're seeing people who show up every week, so you get to see, kind of read the comments of your, your friends and acquaintances. You're all sharing a similar interest, uh, it, the forums, etc. It's just amazing uh, access to this. Uh, if you're Thai, which your, your, your name sounds Thai, you can watch the Thai news, you know, anytime in your own language. And uh, so your feeling of homesickness, by the way, you can pretty well go to a Thai restaurant anywhere in the world now, <laughs> and pretty good Thai restaurants. <laughs> so <clears throat> it, it is a different world. Uh, you're never very far away from anybody anymore. Uh, just in my lifetime, it's just amazing the, the the changes and uh, of, of all of this so yeah in uh, use the the internet for communication and uh, and keeping in touch with your friends family and uh, with the Dhamma as well yeah. next question is from Lance in Victoria British Columbia Canada I'm only able to sit upright during meditation for 15 minutes until back pain forces me to lay down for the rest of the day's meditations. I never fall asleep while lying down to meditate. Are there any other benefits to sitting upright during meditation? The main reason is simply that you, for most people, they, they ha there is a tendency to fall asleep if you lie down. And so the sitting posture is almost the optimal posture for meditation. And standing is okay, but you can't really stand without moving for very long. And walking is also good, but you can't really get into deep states of stillness while you're walking. You have to keep your eyes open and make to know where you're stepping, etc. <clears throat> so lying down is it you the buddha says when you're lying down you should meditate but he doesn't say i recommend that you lie down to meditate it's like if you're lying down meditate <laughs> uh sitting is the optimal posture for deep states of of stillness and by the way, the sitting, <clears throat> the main feature of the body in sitting is that the, the hips are higher than the knees. So you'll see, uh, particularly Westerners trying to sit in meditation and they, their knees are up by their chin, you know. Their knees are higher than their hip and so therefore your mm -hmm. spine is, is pushed out. And it's it's uh, uncomfortable and it doesn't it's not good. So you see the sitting posture, say for a, uh, a classical pianist, <clears throat> that they are the 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 sitting posture is the knees are lower than the the, the hip. Uh, again, for studying like student postures, I don't know whether they teach posture anymore in the, 
is very clear. You know, the, the back needs this this uh, S curve, slight S curve. The lower back is in slightly indented, and then it comes out, and that's the upright posture for. And in order for that to occur, the 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 the, knee, the hip should be here, and the knee should be here, uh, inclined down, <clears throat> or it should be more like this: the hip here and the knee here. And this, if you cross your legs, you can achieve that. But also sitting on a chair, you can achieve that hip higher than the knee. And then the S curve of the back. This is the optimal sitting posture. <clears throat> if you're if you're <clears throat> if you have uh, problems, uh, you know, back problems, and everything, it's better at least you know, don't just give up meditation. If you have to lie down, please do. <clears throat> the hammock meditation, you know. Maybe a hammock is better. It slightly, it slightly elevates your, your head, <clears throat> but gives your back relief. Uh, so in some tropical countries, uh, the, uh, there's a lot of hammock use in it. The hammock has a special, it's not a mat, it's not a flat mattress. It, it, it's a banana shaped, it's slightly curved and uh, gives you back relief, but at the same time elevates your head. So it's a way of relaxing the body, but still having some uh, <clears throat> help, physical help for the mental state. I know Thay, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh uh, liked uh, lying in a hammock. <laughs> Vietnamese uh, idea, hammock idea. Yeah, go ahead. Next. Next question is from a live chat from Ter <clears throat> Terry in New York City, United States. I've been meditating for 20 years, but feel like a beginner each time I sit down. I feel like I can't reach my full potential with the challenges of lay life. How to make peace with this? Well, that is why we have, you know, monastic life. Uh, the Buddha was asked, can, can a lay person attain enlightenment? And he said, yes. And then, so why why do you have these monks and nuns? Why do you have this special lifestyle and everything? And the Buddha's just answer was, it's because it's easier. <laughs> you have, it's kind of like a musician, you know, if you have to work in the day as a carpenter and then play at night, you're, it, <laughs> monastic life is, is like for full-time professional <clears throat> contemplative practice and uh, the layperson doesn't quit their day job. So they're trying to be, you're trying to be a contemplative without quitting your day job. And by the way, you know, there is some risk in quitting your day job. <laughs> to, to go forth as a, as a monk, you got to renounce your, your wealth and your <clears throat> family and friends and all of these things. So th this stepping off into space and there's no guarantee that, that, you will find satisfaction in that life. It might be very hard for you. And then you'll, then you might have to leave the monastic life to go back to the lay life. And then your, your life's being interrupted. So there's, there's gambles and risks on both sides. All of these things are risks. If you stay in the lay life, yeah, well, maybe you secure your, you get your job and so forth, but it's busy and it just seems endless intrusions and so forth. And you, you, it's hard to make progress in it. So this is, uh, don't be surprised. Um, what's the surprise? It's not easy. Uh, the, the inner transformation is not easy. And the fact that you got to deal with families and jobs and all of this stuff at the same time, don't be surprised, you know, that, uh, that it's hard. Yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> Next question from the live chat is from Johan in Sweden. Does Theravada claim monopoly on enlightenment? I've had a great time lately reading about different saints and sadhus, some of whom seem very advanced, maybe even enlightened. This is one of the last questions the Buddha was asked near the end of his life. Uh, are there enlightened people in other uh, religions and so forth? And he said, 
Wherever the Eightfold Path is found, there you will find uh, people of the first, second, third, and fourth stages of enlightenment. But if the Eightfold Path is not found, then you won't find the people of that uh, that are enlightened. <clears throat> so, uh, the word enlightenment is just a just a word. That's all it is, and uh, it's rather widely used. It's used for a whole revolution in in mm -hmm. Europe. The the Enlightenment, which includes the French Revolution, where they chopped off everybody's head. That was how enlightened was that? You know, they got rid of the kings and they got rid of the church, and so oh, wonderful how enlightened. Um, uh, there's all kinds of fakes and frauds. Uh, the, the bad gurus, you know, molesting children along the way, you know, just like, give me a break. <laughs> just, uh, I, this is something that, you know, I, I'm spending my whole life in the, uh, educating myself about the spiritual world and, and the claims that people make. And there's such a, a huge level of fraud and scandal out there, please, those people grow up, <laughs> be very, very questioning of people who are claiming enlightenment and gurus, uh, gurus claiming this and that, cults and so forth. Uh, please, you know, just... <clears throat> scrutinize the claims. Uh, these are, do not, and do not just believe this stuff. Just somebody says they're enlightened and you believe it? <laughs> Why would you? <clears throat> so, by the way, so for Theravada monks, the, the monks, uh, this is direct from the time of the Buddha, so monks do not make claims to supernormal attainments enlightenment or you know psychic capacities or anything to lay people at all just don't uh, so when you see these uh, gurus claiming enlightenment and so forth and this is the the buddha's advocacy for the monks is like don't 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 be talking about that to lay people if you want to talk about what you think is your stage of enlightenment or some supernormal attainments of meditation or something like this, then talk to other monks who are experienced in this. <clears throat> and uh, be very careful. Don't make any false claims about this. You could be tossed out of the Sangha for making false claims, especially to lay people who are taking, claiming you're enlightened. And if, it, if, it's, if it's false, then you're, you're tossed out. So never to return in this this life. So uh, you have a constitution uh, in the Buddhist world as well about the behavior of monks. And when you get these, uh, there's all these non-dualistic schools and Vedanta claims and yogi claims and all kinds of people claiming this. What what you want to ask is what. How how can I uh, verify it through your speech and actions that you are enlightened? What what would you not do? What where are your boundaries? And if you step over those boundaries, uh, what are the consequences? If 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 they have no boundaries, if the and there are schools like this where the guru is above the rules. So you, you see this in politics uh, or in any state government where such and such a leader is above the rules. It has no law uh, uh, applying to them. Uh, run. <laughs> run away. <clears throat> any, time, any, any school where the leader is above the regulations, is above the rules, run. They have to be held to a, a, a profoundly clear moral standard and in, in, including all of the their involvement in sensuality and in, and any violence or anything like that, it's just simply that is mm -hmm. why the Buddhist teaching is so remarkably clear, lucid, and uh, it's a safety uh, structure as well. You can't get away with it. You can't get away with manipulation or deception. 
So in schools where there is no boundaries, then they can get away with anything. Anybody can claim anything. And if you believe it, that that's foolish on your part. Yeah? Okay. Next question <clears throat> is from the live chat from Alessandra in the UK. I feel a constant knot at the solar plexus area, and I think it's related to an underlying sense of fear of life, an ancient fear of not coping. Sometimes this sensation stops when I meditate and when I'm laughing over something funny. Do you think that meditation and the Noble Eightfold Path will eventually unroot this painful sensation? Or is it wise to add other practices aimed at healing the nervous system? Thank you so much. Yeah, the knot is, uh, you know, uh, most people have it. It's ang anxiety is what the knot is, you know, fear, anxiety. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not necessarily attributable to any particular event in your life. Um, there's ob obviously people who have trauma and so forth in their life. Trauma is requires two participants, the the person that is being traumatized and, and then the situation. And sometimes just the, the most mild thing can traumatize a person. They were barked at by a dog when they were three and then they've been terrified ever since. And others uh, even attacked by dogs and it just brush it off, you know. So uh, this is, trauma is, is sen a sensitive reaction to the world <clears throat> around you. And the only way out of it ultimately is to desensitize yourself and detach yourself from these things and detach yourself from the very preservation of the body and all of the, all of the things because the body is uh, very vulnerable in the world and the world is very aggressive towards the human body and then also towards your sense of self. So people blame you and then they praise you and then they... They, you you succeed something sometimes and you fail and so forth. So that you're vulnerable psychologically. The world is very rough, uh, a rough neighborhood uh, to the body and to the sense of dignity, of the human dignity. Until you transcend this, then you will always have that knot in your stomach. But things like, uh, you know, yoga stretching and going to a spa or having good friends can help, you know, uh, psych therapy, <laughs> psychological therapy might help. By the way, I can't just give blanket approval of therapy in general or s psychologists in general. There's, they're all over the map. I mean, there's a new school every two years, new ideas. So uh, I can't say that therapy will benefit. You go to therapy. What therapy? What, what therapy? It's like go... I don't know, go to a country. <laughs> what country? <laughs> it's bizarre. Uh, uh, there is no independent sort of accreditation <clears throat> through a university or something like this, some sort of society of s therapists that that makes it okay or good. You know, like uh, w what exactly is that therapist teaching, et cetera? <laughs> like, we have to question all these things. You can see history is just littered with the corpses of bad ideas <laughs> in psychiatry and psychotherapy and in psychology. <laughs> so it's not that I would say, oh, avoid them at all costs. It's just like, it may, maybe it'll help. It might. You might get the right therapist, you know, good ideas, etc. Maybe, maybe. But ultimately, this process of reformulating your vision of life will help if you can do it. But not everybody can do it. So, or they can't do it quickly, etc. So, but if you, yes, if you walk down the path, you will get the results, and that result will undo that knot of anxiety in your stomach. Uh, can other systems help? Yes, yeah, some, but. Which one? Uh, this is the thing. Yeah. Next question is from Casper in Horsens, Denmark. Any advice on how to deal with tinnitus, especially during meditation? 
Uh, tinnitus. Yeah. Uh, well, that's very uh, troubling. Uh, it depends on how long you've had it. Uh, usually when you first get it, it, it's really disturbing, but it tends to, you, you tend to acclimatize to it. It's like moving to out, out of the country to a noisy city. At first, it just, you can't sleep. You, so, you know, I live in a monastery in the country. So it's probably one of the quietest places on the planet. I live in, in Canada in winter at 1,200 meters. There's no birds even chirping. I live in a small cottage with triple glazed windows and it's just silent as the grave there. Now, if I go to uh, a city and, uh, and have to spend a night in the city, it's, it's quite startling. As, but others, they li- they're, they're used to it. So tinnitus is, is, a, is a sound and the, uh, the brain, the mind is, is designed to acc- acclimatize to, to sounds. Obviously, if, if you couldn't, uh, it's very problematic. So nature kind of builds in, like, you can get used to these sounds and the sound of your own ears. It's almost like a koan, isn't it? It's like the sound of one hand clapping and one, one ear buzzing, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, you can get used to it. And then the primary way is you you, you don't, you don't li- you don't focus on that sound. You focus on the meditation object, which is uh, the breath, perhaps, or loving kindness, to such an extent that the uh, sound consciousness, ear consciousness, is gone. By the way, so this is Buddhist theory. This is even in the Abhidhamma. Theoretically, we can only experience one sensory. Uh, element at a time. So we can see a sight, a sound, a smell, a taste, a touch, or, or an idea, we, uh, we're not actually experiencing them at simultaneously. So theoretic, from this is an interesting psychological thing. You're watching me and hearing me and you think you're hearing and seeing me at the same time, but Apparently, the mind is flickering back and forth between these two things. Uh, because if, if, like, for instance, if you, you're in New York City on September 11th, 2001, uh, and you, you're looking out the window and you see a plane fly right into the World Trade Center, and at that moment, and you're your mother is over there saying, supper's ready, dear. You will not hear your mother say, supper's ready, dear. You're, you're glued to the visual consciousness. You will not hear anybody behind you at all. Or if you are, you know, sitting, gazing out the window at your backyard, which is in nothing, is a nothing backyard, and then somebody in the in the in a bedroom or the neighbor screams, blood curdling scream. You will not see your backyard. You will be your consciousness will be completely swallowed by that sound. <clears throat> so there you see that we're actually flickering between uh, types of sensory experience, and that. If you focus on one, the other one subsides in the background. So if you focus on the sight, the sound will will diminish or be absent. So with tinnitus, then you really focus on that, not on that sound, but into the the visual or imaginative or the the touch sense of the of the air, the breath, meditation, and then that tinnitus will will disappear uh, in terms of your consciousness. It may, may come back when you're not focusing on something else, but uh, for meditation, when you focus on, on your, uh, your consciousness on your meditation object, the, the sound 
aspect of tinnitus will be uh, out of the range of your consciousness. Yeah. Next question from the live chat is from Tuning in Syria. Venerable Ajahn, how important is acquiring merit in our practice? And what is merit in Theravada Buddhism? The, 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 there's some confusion about this. Uh, quite often you'll see uh, enthusiasts, enlightenment enthusiasts are dismissing merit, acts of merit. So they want to get on with Nibbana. But he, the Buddha says even to monks, says, monks, do not be afraid of merit. Merit is another word for happiness. So what is merit? Happiness. Uh, positive acts which increase positive energy in one's life. The Buddha says, though, that don't be, don't presume that just uh, the conventional meritorious actions, say, of generosity and uh, responsibility, kindness, things like that, are the ultimate goal of life. They are, they produce beautiful effects. Uh, they have beautiful consequences, generosity, virtuous behavior. Uh, positive uh, communication with others, uh, giving gifts of all kinds, including educating people, um, providing shelter, food, clothing, shelter, medicine to people. Uh, all of the things that we can give to each other are beautiful things with great and beautiful consequences, including mm -hmm. the psychological dimension, not just well, we, we we're saying that abundance comes back when you give with the right attitude. Then whatever you gave away comes back abundantly. But also the uh, the emotion that you gave with returns in a heightened f fashion. So this uh, this is another word for happiness. It's just the nature of of creating happiness. Try it. It's you'll, you'll see. It's self evident. Even a little, you know, a child can learn generosity very early. They can uh, share a cookie with a with somebody, and uh, they 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 get a positive feedback. There's a positive feedback loop when we when we share with the right attitude. Yeah. Next question is from the live chat from James in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. As someone with F phantasia, mind blindness. I struggle with visualization and casinas, but wonder if I should just focus on the formless. Yeah, uh, aphantasia is like, if you're not familiar with this, is, uh, and you might, you might even have aphantasia and not know it. Uh, it's the, the inability to visualize, uh, imaginatively visualize. Some people have no capacity to have a visual imagination. It's zero. And others, they, you know, they're imagining they can, they can enter into a world, an inner world of visuals. They can see things in, in great detail, vividly. <clears throat> so this is uh, what James is asking about. And yes, of course, if you have aphantasia, you can't uh, these what are called uh, casino practices where you're visualizing the primary colors of red, blue, yellow, white, uh, or any of these things, then yeah, it's not for you. So never mind that. And the formless though is not, is a very, the formless meditations are uh, on the, on the kind of the, the formless idea of space, uh, consciousness, nothing, and minimal perception. <laughs> you know, these are abstract concepts, abstractions. Uh, but they're very lofty, very refined. It's probably not worth your time to invest in those. But you can go with the, the touch of air. So air is not a visual. Uh, so breath meditation is not visual. It's uh, the contact of air. It's the after effect of the feeling of air and the kind of a, the, an entire body feeling of airiness, lightness, coolness, airiness. That a person with aphantasia can 
can experience that and retain that feeling of of divine buoyancy and airiness. Very beautiful. Uh, you can also focus on the sub sublime emotions of loving kindness, of compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. These are good topics for you. And of course, uh, you can still uh, reflect uh, about the nature of the body so that you can do the four, the four foundations of mindfulness are available to you. Uh, although you can't visualize the parts of your body, you can look at, you know, illustrations of the internal organs of the body, the 32 parts of the body. You can, you can look at the nine stages of the decomposition of a corpse and so forth as well. Uh, so there, there are types of uh, meditation, many types of meditations that are available to you, but you should just give up on, on trying to do casino meditation. Uh, with that involve colors or shapes because you have to internalize these things. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that is uh, it for today. So we will um, see you next week if everything works out. <laughs>